Welcome to the broadcast. You know, with this new administration, with the Biden administration, it puts to the forefront issues in the Middle East. It puts to the forefront issues like Israel and protecting the promised land. We've got an ACLJ documentary that we put together on that very issue, protecting the state of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel. I think it's an important time now because of all these issues that we're going to be addressing, some which have been addressed already for good. You know, the capital is going to remain in Jerusalem. I'm glad the Biden administration did that. But that's one small step. What about the bigger issues? What about the peace deals that were made? What about the idea that you don't have to figure out the Palestinian issue before you can figure out making other peace deals? What, what about entering in again that failed nuclear agreement with Iran? So today, I, I think it's just a critical time to, re, to kind of re-up our knowledge about the issues that we'll face are number one ally in the Middle East, and a state that is so important to many of us, the Jewish state of Israel. Because we've been used to these last four years of an administration that was doing everything they can to protect the promised land. Now it's going to be up to us, putting a lot more pressure on our government, on international organizations, working with the state of Israel, working with organizations to make sure we protect the promised land. Check out our ACLJ documentary right now. Graphic new video of violent protests and terror attacks coming out of Israel. They have a gender apartheid inside Gaza. Christians are evacuating because churches are being burned. Their doctrine is, is fascist and genocidal against Jews. Today, the group Hamas declared a day of rage, urging attacks on Israelis. Peace has no greater enemy than the forces of militant Islam. <laughs> moment, you know, these rockets and missiles on the border with Lebanon could be sprung and, and fired against, uh, against Israel. Hamas and Al-Qaeda are these terrorist groups with the goal of destroying the West. We got a multiple officers here. We got officers running here, back east now, chasing now on foot. So we understand people are scared, and we understand that there's concern that there may be more folks out there. When they say that, that Israel should be wiped out, that they mean it. I don't have the luxury not to believe this. Israel's right to exist has been a cornerstone for the ACLJ since its inception. With an office in the heart of Jerusalem, ACLJ continues to be a leader in the advocacy for the Jewish state of Israel. Chief Counsel Jay Sekulow has brought together ACLJ's leading experts from around the globe to present Protecting the Promised Land, the case for Israel. We just heard death to America, death to Israel in the opening of this documentary. I want to start with you, David Benjamin, first. You served in the Israeli Defense Force, you still do is in the reserves. Uh, you're dealing with international law issues. But the death to America, death to Israel, is the, has been the thematic of these groups in the region. What is the situation in the region right now as you see it? Well, I would say if they don't mean it, why are they making such an effort to, to create this buildup just about on every frontier that Israel has, particularly in the north now in Syria? Um, in Lebanon, it's not a new story. You have Hezbollah now with an arsenal of, in the region of 140,000 rockets, all of them from Iran. Um, you have the Houthi situation in Saudi Arabia now creeping up from the southern front. Um, you have Hamas in Gaza, uh, who are being supported by Iran. If you, look at, if you step back and look at the picture, you can see the circle enclosing around Israel and think, well, why make the effort if they're not 
being serious about carrying out their threats. So, which raises the next issue, Rami, and that is the nature of the threat and the Iran factor. Um, Iran has become a major player in the region now, and there's a history to this that a lot of people do not know. Well, if you um, come from the intelligence field where I come from, we always have to measure intent and capabilities. And uh, regarding the intent of the Iranians, we just heard death to America, and we hear it from their le leaders for many, many years. Regarding the capabilities, they're trying to develop atom bombs in order to rule the world. Now, going back to what David has been saying, the Iranians have been trying to take over the Middle East, get all the way up to the Mediterranean, just like they used to rule that region 2,500 years ago. And when you listen to the Iranians and you look at their actions, the Houthis, the Houthis are Shiites, in Yemen that are shooting missiles at Riyadh's airports and are trying to take over Bab el Mandeb uh, straits in the uh, sea in order to control the oil flow to the west. So when you look at Syria, when you look at Lebanon, when you look at what they're doing with Hamas in the south, you understand that they mean business when they speak about death to America and they mean business when they speak about death to Israel. Iranians have stated openly, simply, openly, that they want to destroy the state of Israel. Period, exclamation point. They speak of illegitimacy in the name of God. From Iran, from Hezbollah, and from Hamas, you hear that it's a religious commandment that Israel should not exist, that a non-Muslim state cannot be here. If this uh, has the upper hand, this trend, it's going to be tougher. This layer of religious fanaticism on top of political debates makes debates almost without a resolution. Because you know, gods never compromise, people do. You're dealing with a regime uh, headed up by a religious fanatic. The Ayatollah in Iran has a religious uh, view that has no place for the state of Israel, fellow Muslims who disagree with him, and our country. He is a religious Nazi. On the day we voted on the Iran nuclear deal, he tweeted out, Allah willing, Israel won't exist in 25 years. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei posted incendiary comments about Israel. He flatly predicted that Israel won't be around 25 years from now. And he warned that between now and then, Israel would have to worry about what he called the, quote, spirit of fighting heroism and jihad. Today, after two years of negotiations, the United States, together with our international partners, has achieved something that decades of animosity has not. A comprehensive long-term deal with Iran that will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. A bad deal is worse than no deal. We need to have a good deal here. This deal will not stop Iran from getting a bomb. This deal will all but guarantee it. The Iranian nuclear deal may actually be worse than we originally imagined. I think the deal is absolutely horrible for us, but it's really, really bad for Israel. And we're handing over hundreds of billions of dollars in sanctions relief. Iran is going to have access to $150 billion in assets. Israelis have been telling us, you know, this kind of deal is giving Iran the legitimacy to enrich uranium. Once Iran is able to perform a nuclear test, it would have a, a shield, a nuclear mushroom all over Iran that would uh, prevent, deter the U.S. and Israel from doing anything to retaliate against Iran or work against Iran when it supports jihadist groups in the Middle East or worldwide. Think of how arrogant Hezbollah will act and Hamas if Iran wins and it gets nuclear. So I think the stakes are very high. If Iran gets the bomb, even if it doesn't use it, it would alter profoundly the history of the Middle East. Iran's rulers promise to destroy my country, murder my people, and the response from this body, the response from nearly every one of the governments represented here has been 
absolutely nothing. Utter silence. Deafening silence. We have to talk about America's interests in the region, and that's starting with our defense as a country of Israel and why it's strategically important. Absolutely. I was at a meeting not long ago, within the last year, year and a half, with the Egyptian consul in New York. And it was a meeting of members of Congress and a couple of people from think tanks. And, and the ambassador, he was pleading, pleading with us, saying, why don't you see the threat? He said, why don't you see the threat from the region? It's a threat to your country. It's a threat to your country before any other country. He said, we see it. We know we have Egyptian nationals in this country, and they go to mosques where they're being radicalized. And we know if Iran gets this nuclear deal, which they now have, right, we will absolutely have to get nuclear weapons. The Saudis will absolutely have to get nuclear weapons because, you know, and here's how you know the truth. Israel has had a nuclear capability, you know, the, the secret that everyone knows, for decades. And there's not been an arms race. There's not been a nuclear race in the Middle East because they know Israel will not first launch. Israel just wants a defensive capability. But they know that's not true about Iran. So first you know that Iran will use it. The second thing is Iran is developing intercontinental ballistic missiles not to reach Israel, but to reach us in this country. Let's talk, Mark, about this. Um, Israel's an ally of the United States, but this ongoing conflict, you look at it historically, uh, over the, the modern time uh, of Israel's existence, the last 70 years, this ongoing conflict has been continuous. And the fact is, sometimes it's different players coming to the forefront. Now it's Iran. But the regional conflict focused on Israel, there's a historic record that is uh, indisputable. If you just look at the modern era, from 1920, Israel's given this wonderful small area for close settlement of the land in the San Remo Treaty. And then in 1922, the League of Nations sets up a mandate. Israel's finally going to have a place where Jews can come and settle. And then 78% of it is lopped off and given to Transjordan. And you think, all right, fine, the Jews will remain in that last 22%. And the first plan, the Peel Commission, gives 80% of that they try to give away, and Jews will have 20%. Throughout history, at every single point in time, all people have tried to do is cut Israel into smaller and smaller pieces. And eventually, the time came in 1948, and again in 67, and again in 73, and we see it again today. They just say, you know what, forget anything, let's just wipe them off the map. And yes, the players keep on changing, but unfortunately, the ideology behind it has never been about peace. There's an interesting dynamic with all this, though, and that is that the United States has a strategic interest. What is new is what the region is starting to shape like, the look of the region as far as who the players are. So I want to I want to talk about that for a minute. There's been wars. Mark just laid out some of those wars. But then it's always, there's like the war between wars. You know, in, in the last seven years, the Middle East went through an earthquake. Countries have been turned apart. Uh, if you look at what happened in Sudan, if you look at what happened in uh, Egypt, if you look at what happened in um, uh, the, even the Palestinian Authority, a lot of changes. Israel has to face new type of enemies. The war, the countries became uh, proxies of Iran, and Israel has to face threats from uh, different uh, terrorist groups, and we call it stealth wars. And the reason we're fighting those stealth wars, which is an everyday fight, yeah. is to prevent the next war. So when you're engaging in a stealth war, uh, and you're the lawyer advising the military, you face different kind of challenges. The other side is not engaging in the laws of armed conflict when they engage. They use civilians as targets. Uh, this is part and parcel of how they operate. So what does that put on you as the lawyer representing Israeli military? You've touched on a crucial legal point because um, once upon a time, people spoke about the law of war. And the idea was that applies in situations where, where armies, entire armies clash against one another. And these situations in between, the war between wars, as, as Rami has put it, what law actually applies there? And it really took Israel to stick its neck out initially and say, you know, these are also armed conflicts. These are wars just on a lower intensity. We need to apply the same laws. We can't get by as much of the world has, ex has expected in the past on just applying regular principles, say, of criminal law. The idea that criminals, terrorists are criminals, you have to arrest them, put them on trial. You can't apply that to an organization like Hezbollah, which is a more powerful military than most countries on earth, or even Hamas. Um, so legally, that, has had, that is being very significant, that the law of war is actually 
it's, it's relevant on all different levels of intensity and including in the war between wars. But right over there and right over there are two villages controlled by Hezbollah and we've got coming in our background right now Jeeps from the Israeli Defense Force. This is the blue line. How significant of a zone is this? How, how dangerous is well, this? You know, I must say that my experience for the past 30 years, you know, I've uh, been to this movie before. Yeah. Maybe the difference is now it's a 3D movie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with so many other forces involved. Uh, but this is a security border in Israel. Uh, there's peace now. It's a fragile peace. It's a deceptive peace. That why do you say, you say it, we talked about that before. Just why deceptive peace? It's deceptive because at any moment, you know, these 40,000 rockets and missiles on the border with Lebanon uh, could, you know, be sprung and, and fired against uh, against Israel. Uh, after the, the war, uh, the Lebanon army t took, uh, took place on the forts and on the border. We see a lot of movement of the UN, but uh, we know to the citizen uh, vehicles that, uh, uh, that the Hezbollah owns, uh, we know they're looking out and we know they're uh, uh, preparing for the next battle day. We're asserting that uh, Iran is actually engaging in this war with, with through Hezbollah. Is that the sense that yeah, you have as you're training? Sure, that's what we learn also. All the weapons uh, and the training is uh, all uh, Iranian uh, money and uh, Techniques. You can find the Iranian regime fingerprints everywhere, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in the Palestinian arena, in Yemen, in South America. In the north, we have Iran, oh, Hezbollah, which is an Iranian division on our border, practically and literally and in every sense, uh, you know, directed directly from Iran When you look at your neighbors, David, as an Israeli, you've got the leadership of Syria being propped up right now by the Russians and the Iranians. Yet you have the Sunnis in the form of ISIS trying to gain a foothold. And you're a lawyer that gives legal advice to the military in Israel, and you've got a border with Syria. Yeah. What are you facing? You know, I'd like to quote the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. He said, my enemy's enemy is my enemy. Yeah. I think that so much, so perfectly sums up the situation which is developing in Syria, which is uh, over the years. Um, it's, it's really complicated. It, it raises all sorts of legal questions about who exactly is the enemy, who's attacking you, who isn't, who isn't attacking you at any given time. Uh, the map can actually change. Rami, looking at it diplomatically, because you have to look at it diplomatically, there has been a realignment a strategic realignment within the region. I mean, 20 years ago, the thought that the Israelis and the Saudis would have the kind of relationship they now have, completely unexpected. And it is the common enemy. You deal with Jordan and Egypt. What is the sense when you're dealing with those world leaders as they view Israel right now? How does, how does al-Sisi in Egypt view Israel? How does Abdullah, King Abdullah in Jordan, view Israel right now? I was actually um, a guest of the King of uh, Jordan in Amman, Abdullah, about three years ago. And he was speaking about the Arab Spring as the Arab Winter. He saw what's happening. He saw ISIS coming to its border from the uh, Syrian side. He saw ISIS coming to his borders from the Iraqi side. And he felt very threatened about it. Uh, Sisi sees, the, just spoke yesterday about the peace with Israel. It's 40 years since uh, Sadat uh, came to Israel, just this week. Sisi spoke about the peace with Israel as a blessing to Egypt and to the region. I believe that if we go back to the Iranian strategy that has been revealed to take over the Middle East, actually a lot of people believe that Iran wants to take over Mecca because of religious reasons. So if you take the intentions of Iran and you look at the abilities of Israel, today the Arabs, the Sunni countries, are looking at Israel's abilities to intercept missiles, for example, which we learned to do after the Gaza wars. They look at Israel's ability to defend itself and they look at the Israeli interest to stop the Iranians. 
They saw the Israel war in 2006, the second Lebanon war with Hezbollah. They saw our different wars in Gaza. They saw the ability that we have. They received some of our technologies. So today, both Sisi and Abdullah and the uh, Gulf states leaders understand that in order to stop Iran, we have to work together. You've traveled to that region, the Gulf states. Um, what was your sense? Because you met with leaders while you were there. You know, the, the, the individuals that are running those countries are the same people fa or families oftentimes who are funding the people flying planes into our buildings. So it's a complicated. I, you don't want to rely on them as your number one ally. If it comes down to who you want to uh, stand next to in a, in a battle, you want to stand next to an Israeli, you don't want to stand next to an Iraqi soldier that's running away or attacking uh, the, the base where the Americans are at. And so that's the sense that you put, is that there, there's obviously a, a, a big American presence. And that's why our president can go into Saudi Arabia and use the terminology radical Islamic terrorism and people not running towards the door. It's not that idea, because these regimes understand it's a threat from within to them, to their existence. And so it, you can call yourself a king, but your kingdom may not be very stable. You could be a prince, but the, the, the other royal family is the person writing the check to ISIS. It gets more complicated in that region than it does, I think, for the Iranians. They have a supreme leader. So when they come in, they have, they have, they've got their guardian council of 12, but they have a supreme leader who sets all of their, uh, their religious, ideological, political uh, motivations and their spread of their networks. Now, I think it's, it's very frightening. You, you wouldn't think of an Iran that would fire a missile into or authorize one of its proxies to fire a missile at the Saudis. Let me, and it has. Let's talk about the proxy aspect of this because this is, we talk about a proxy war. Let me define that. So Iran, although they are now sending troops into the region, before what they would do is utilize groups like Hamas and Hezbollah as their proxy. In other words, fighting the war for them. So you're in a conflict that is, I always say when you're dealing with the, with the Middle East, you need to think nine dimensionally. So when we talk about a proxy war, the Iranians have utilized other forces to advance their own agenda. Now, the reason the Iranians do not get along with, for instance, ISIS is part of the Shia Sunni conflict, but also because Iran wants to establish the great caliphate when ISIS looked like they were establishing the caliphate. But let's focus in on the proxy nature of this asymmetrical conflict. Well, I think that's, that's a great concern, especially to Israel, because of their border with Lebanon. So what we have with Iran and their involvement in the Syrian war is that now Syria has, is going to become like a, a community of Iran. I mean, that's how serious it is, and that's how serious the involvement of Iran is in Syria. And next to Syria, we have Lebanon, which now is, is effectively being run by Hezbollah. So on the border of Israel, what we have is Hezbollah running a country, and they have free reign. So it's not like a terrorist group operating within a country. They are basically running the country. So we have the free flow of arms, sophisticated weapons, very sophisticated from Iran through Syria into Lebanon, sitting 150,000 missiles ready and being aimed at major Israeli cities. And so that proxy war on that border of Israel and Lebanon with Hezbollah is very serious. Now we're seeing, of course, the rise of Islamic extremism. I think this has been the dream that one day the caliphate would be reestablished, which is basically this Islamic empire uh, ruled under Islamic Sharia law. This is something they had dreamed about, and now their dream has come true. And I think it's called ripples throughout the Islamic world, where whether it's in Libya or the Sinai Peninsula, as far away as the Philippines, it's sort of uh, fueled the imagination of many Muslims and now are pledging allegiance to ISIS. Two men entered the building in the center of the French capital late this morning morning and began firing. By the time they'd stopped, at least 12 people were dead. Many others were seriously injured. Gunfire erupted. You could hear it from the outside. And in the midst of the attack, the killer himself. Authorities say he called 911 to pledge his allegiance to the terror group ISIS. A lorry heads for the crowd. 
Witnesses spoke of how the vehicle swerved several times, maximising the carnage. 84 people we now understand have been killed. There are 80 more in a critical uh, condition. Reports of an explosion at an Ariana Grande concert. They have confirmed multiple fatalities, multiple fatalities and a number of injured right there at the scene. Screams and panic tonight on Barcelona's most famous pedestrian street. They were running from a van that plowed into crowds on the street. Tonight, authorities are calling it an act of terrorism. ISIS is now claiming responsibility. A deliberate act of terror, a man accused of using a truck as a weapon to kill innocent people. This is the kind of lone wolf terrorism that keeps police up at night. Eight people are dead, at least 12 injured. This was an act of terror and a particularly cowardly act of terror. So you just saw part one of our ACLJ documentary, Protecting the Promised Land. Tune in next week to see part two of Protecting the Promised Land. We've got to be ready to support our ally, Israel.